prayer as we look to his word for his truth. Father, we, we pause another moment asking that you would intervene in a very real way, that you would season our expositional study of your word with your grace. Keep back all of our distractions that we come, be they financial or physical or uh, some of us come here tired, some are thinking about dinner later on and uh, we, we got these smart gadgets that uh, end up uh, distracting us as well. Help us to focus on your truth. Might your spirit convict us of sin, exhort us towards righteousness. Might he give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you speak to your church now. And God, we continue to beg that you'd use this epistle written to the saints at Rome to revive our hearts and to transform us from one level of glory to another. For your own glory we ask it. Amen. Well, friends, let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me in Romans chapter 1. I'd like to preach to a sermon that I've entitled, Unashamed of the Gospel, God's Power unto Salvation. Unashamed of the Gospel, God's Power unto Salvation. The the powerful gospel is the theme of the entire book, and in a nutshell, verses 16 and 17 give us a preview of that. Now, as we think about the importance of the gospel... Because you take away the gospel from Christianity, there is no Christianity. And you know that many times I do not, even if I quote him, I, I don't refer to MacArthur often because people think that because I went to the Master Seminary and I worked for my beloved friend and mentor for nine years that I'd be a MacArthurite. And I'm not. I love the guy. He's got a very big imprint in my life and ministry. But I will use him by name. After 54 years of gospel preaching, faithful Bible exposition, you you know, there's a lot of times the the headlines are those that disqualify themselves from ministry, financially, immorally. But where are the, where's the honor to whom honor is due that over half a century, you've got a man who has not only been preaching the gospel, but defending the gospel because the church of our day is confused about the gospel. You look at a lot of his books, whether it be hard to believe or ashamed of the gospel. I thought that that title for ashamed of the gospel was quite apropos because the church seems to be ashamed of the gospel. Spurgeon said, everywhere there is apathy. Nobody cares whether that which is preached is true or false. A sermon is a sermon, whatever the subject. You know, the preface to the first edition of Ashamed of the Gospel said this, quote, acceptability in the culture and increased church attendance have subtly but steadily usurped holiness and true worship as the primary objectives of our church gatherings. Preaching the Word and boldly confronting sin are seen as archaic, ineffectual means of winning the world. After all, those things actually drive most people away. Why not entice people into the fold by offering what they want? creating a friendly, comfortable environment and catering to the very desires that drive their strongest urges. As if we might get unconverted worldlings to accept Jesus by somehow making Him more likable or making His message less offensive to them. That kind of thinking badly skews the mission of the church. The Great Commission is not a marketing manifesto. True evangelism does not require salesmen but requires prophets. It's the Word of God, not any earthly enticement that plants the seed for the new birth. We gain nothing but God's displeasure if we seek to remove the offense of the cross. You know, ashamed of the gospel was the answer to the modern pragmatic church. If it works, let's do it. I was a Bible major in Bible college, and I went out to be an intern two different summers. And one of those summers is when I sat under a pastor who is a big pupil 
of Bill Hybels and the whole Willow Creek model because we got to get unsaved Harry and Sally to feel more comfortable in the walls of the church knowing that the ceiling's not going to fall down around them when in reality when we do the Lord's table or believers baptism it ought to look weird to the world this is not according to the world this is otherworldly that the believers engage in every Lord's day to quote the Spurge one more time he says where the gospel is fully and powerfully preached with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, our churches do not only hold their own, but win current converts. But when that which constitutes their strength is gone, we mean when the gospel is concealed and the life of prayer is slighted, the whole thing becomes a mere form and fiction. For this thing our heart is sore grieved." Unquote. There's a lot of cowards in the church. Donald Gray Barnhouse uh, was a great illustrator, great preacher. He said, the worst thing about good people is that they're often such cowards. His words, not mine, so don't get mad at me yet. Save that for later on. We see good people leave a meeting where argument tends to become bitter because they say they do not want to remain in the atmosphere of strife. They thereby run away from a good cause and let it go to the enemy by default. They were afraid to stay and fight for the right. It's right to be ashamed of things that are ignoble, of strife and disunity, but we must not be ashamed of the causes that are right. When our Lord Jesus was arrested, Peter came into the house and was ashamed to be counted the Christ. He denied he knew the Savior and went over to the fire where the Roman soldiers were warming themselves and began to partake of the warmth of their fire. Soon he was noticed and identified and he became ashamed again and swore he didn't know the man. There is in the heart of all men of the race of Adam a tendency to be ashamed of the good and the true, the pure and the beautiful. Certain forms of culture cover the shame in some people and leave them champions of the highest things, but there's a natural bent in the heart of all men to wish to appear no better than the mass. You see, we don't want to stick out. We get too overly self-conscious as if it's about us and not our Lord. Remember when Jesus looked at Peter? After the Nile, the, the Spirit of God brought true repentance to the heart of that erring disciple, and he went out and wept bitterly. What happened to Peter? He was ashamed of his shame. Now he'd stand boldly and would be able to say with Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, of the Jew first and also to the Greek you in our own day, just to bring it a little closer than the first century. I, I can think of at least a couple of events in recent history that brought hostility towards the gospel to try to dissuade us from being faithful to the gospel. I don't remember when it was, the summer or spring, there's a, a big to-do in Medford, uh, the pear blossom, where thousands, I guess uh, they plan on 30 or so thousand people coming for all the festivities and the parades, and, and one faithful evangelist friend was putting a bunch of tracks together and stapling some candy so that as they throw it out to the kids, they might actually pick up that piece that they think is garbage, take it home to mom and dad, and the powerful gospel get a hold of their lives. And some were offended at that. We recently hosted an evangelism conference here. And again, yeah, we understand that we're all a bunch of uh, nuts. We think the fruits and nuts are down in California, right? But they're, they're right here. You know, we'll look at Paul's theology of the fruits and nuts in a moment. But just because we're banding together with faithful evangelists wondering about why we would join up with those that are heckled. It's because when the gates of hell are charged and the church pursues its evangelistic mission that we don't get a do-over in eternity, being outreach-oriented rather than ingrown-itis, 
We become a marked target. Now, as we come to Romans 1, 16 and 17, virtually all scholars acknowledge that these verses before us are decisive for the interpretation of the book of Romans. So we want to see how they fit into the flow of thought so far. Paul started to establish a positive relationship with the Roman believers that he'd never met, conveying his desire to visit them that the sovereign spirit had uh, detoured him many times from that. He wants to build them up in the faith and preach the gospel in Rome. New opportunity, new place, new crowd to preach the good news to. He's eager to preach the gospel according to the previous verse. He said in verse 15, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He never stepped foot there. Paul is eager to preach the gospel. Why? Because he's not ashamed of the gospel, verse 16. He's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God bringing salvation to all who believe. And it's the, power, the, the, the saving power of, of God because the righteousness of God, His saving righteousness, is revealed in it by faith, verse 17. And this saving righteousness of God is supported by the entire Old Testament, which says that the righteous will live by faith. They'll enjoy eternal life by faith. Let's look at those words, verse 16. Notice that little uh, preposition in the Greek, it's gar here. It says for. So he's tying this into what he already said. I can't wait to get to Rome and preach the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, notice how he quotes the Old Testament here, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Verses 16 and 17 end the introduction to the book written to the saints at Rome. Via a tiny transitional bridge in these two verses, Paul assembles three rapid-fire reasons which progressively unfold the grandeur of the gospel. It bridges a link between his passion for its ministry to a presentation of its essence. So, beloved, I want you to embrace these three reasons that you would be more zealously obedient to God's purpose for His church in the world. Notice three reasons you and I should not be ashamed as Paul was not ashamed. There's a personal reason that he gives us, a powerful reason he gives us, and finally a practical reason. He begins with that personal reason which relates to the scandalizing effect of the gospel of God's grace at the beginning of the first half of verse 16. Notice again, he, he he'd said, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You better not be ashamed when you come into Rome. Rome is the powerhouse of the known world at that time. Paul's going to come to this powerhouse of the world, but in his usual manner. Well, we got to remember about Paul, don't we, that he, he did not have a powerful presence or stature. He never came with eloquent words of oratory. In our text, in our scripture reading, we were in Acts 14. Iconium and Lystra. And they figured that he was that Greek god Hermes because he was the speaker. And he wasn't an eloquent all orator. In his personal reason that he gives, he objectively denies being ashamed. That verb, episkunomai, means to be ashamed. I've already referred to Mark 8 where... Uh, you know, or, or uh, the uh, trial of Jesus with Peter. But there was another occasion that there was shame in the life of Peter. Mark 8, uh, 
Peter gives the great confession answering Jesus' question. Remember, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And there were some suggestions what people say he is, who people say he is. But who do you, his disciples, who do you say he is? And Peter, being the spokesperson, said, you are the Christ. Good answer. That's the right answer. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah sent from God that was looked for the entire Old Testament. And when Peter gets it right, immediately Jesus prophesies and teaches that he, the Son of Man, must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Now, friends, it's not going to be a pop quiz, but if you remember our study in the book of Mark, in Mark's presentation of the gospel, the life and ministry of Jesus, three times he prophesies that when we're going up to Jerusalem and this is what's going to happen, I'm going to be done dirty, my words, not his. By the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to rise again. Three times he tells them that. You'd think they'd get it so that when it happened, it's like, duh, this is what you told us was going to happen. But they were as obtuse as we can be. Well, in that passage of Mark 8, where Peter gives the great confession, you are the Christ, Jesus also, at that time, he summoned the crowds with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, in other words, it's not exclusive to those 12 disciples. You, you, you that are listening, if you want to come after me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me, now you see why we're turned here, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." It is natural default setting for mortal man to be ashamed. That's why we need these reminders time and again by our Lord, by His prophets and apostles. Don't be ashamed. You've got the life-altering, eternal-changing gospel, the good news that man needs. And that yet there's failure to confess Him due to fear for our lives. It doesn't make any sense. We understand this, but we don't practice this. So too in 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to his disciple, Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6. He says, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. In other words, Timothy had been ordained to the full-time gospel ministry of the Word. He says, For God's not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Down in verse 12 of 2 Timothy 1. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. In other words, as Paul is telling his protege, don't be ashamed due to persecution, I'm not ashamed, and I've had plenty of it. For I know whom I believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until this day. Verse 16, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. So, beloved church, don't be ashamed. Remember what, when uh, Jesus' disciples were getting anxious? You know, he says, I'm going to send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, and they're going to torture you. Some of you are going to die. And he reminds them that all man can do is kill us. That's not really bad news. It's just quickly in the presence of the Lord to be absent from the bodies to be in His presence. It's not bad news. It's good news. If we stand for righteousness, God's got it all in the bag. So this call to Timothy to be unashamed in the context of expecting suffering. 
You know, the hesitancy to bear witness to the gospel is rooted in fear of suffering harm. Let's get over it, friends. You know, the butterflies in our stomach, they're going to be there when you share the gospel. That's about the worst that we experience. We haven't been stoned. I'm talking literal stones, not the other kind that you might be thinking about in southern Oregon here. Think about what happened just a few years ago during the whole COVID overreach by the government down several miles south of us at Grace Community Church. They wouldn't bow to Caesar. And coming up the 28th, I don't even know what today's date is. I just know the 31st is a Monday because we're flying out a week from tomorrow and I'm starting to get all stressed about that. But whenever the 28th is, so that's coming up sometime towards the end of the week, the, their documentary film is out. July 28th is The Essential Church. And I looked last night and none of our theaters in the area, you've got to go all the way up to Roseburg, but more theaters are being added all the time. And you can see them give a documentary of what happened because the governor found out, I can't shut the church down. And the L.A. County found out, I can't shut the church down. So when JMAC goes back to an empty worship center, they never told people start coming back to worship. He just went and started preaching and people started coming back. Why? Because they're going to allow riots and not concerned about COVID of all times. The church is essential. Open the doors. Keep the doors open. Because once Caesar gets a little power, he's very reluctant to give it back. But we're going to have opposition, these speed bumps in life. The Bible addresses that, how to, how to handle it. You go to the Psalms, and there are often Psalms of lament, where the psalmist is teaching us how to vent our lament to the Lord. We kind of tattletale on God, uh, or to God on our problem people, right? We don't worry, but we pray. And some scholars argue from all those Old Testament allusions and citations of lament, the theology of lament is answered where the suffering of God's people is answered in the gospel. For instance, let me give you a, a sampling. And uh, where am I going? Psalm, Psalm 70. I'm getting there. Psalm 70, first two verses. Here's what the psalmist shows ought to be the default setting in our lives. O oh God, hasten to deliver me. O oh Lord, hasten to my help. Let those be ashamed and, humility, uh, and humiliated who seek my life. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. What's he saying? We're not the ones to be ashamed. Let the enemies of the gospel be ashamed. And he's finding his refuge. He's seeking the Lord. In the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are what? They're safe. He's our rock. He's our refuge. He's our deliverer. And so how is, the, how are, how is that whole theology of lament in the Old Testament answered for the suffering of God's people today? It's answered in the gospel. There's deliverance. Rather than becoming depressed in our lamentations, we pray so that our prayer closet becomes a vessel of deliverance to the redeemed as our eternity has already been settled and we're seeking and struggling to set our minds on things above. We can handle anything Satan throws at us. All his minions of mortal man can do is kill our body and usher us into the open arms of our Heavenly Father. And that's not such a bad deal. I'm worth more to my family dead than alive. They got good, good life insurance. And I'm replaceable. You can find another faithful expositor. And if that's what God has planned for me or you, glory to His name. You know, God's given us two resources in life. His Spirit and His Word. Salvation comes only by God's will, not by man's will. And Jesus solved the whole Old Testament problem of evil by harmonizing divine justice and mercy. The moment we believe we're indwelt by the Spirit and we've already been given the Scriptures, so that by His atoning death, 
He is the divine theodicy, vindicating both divine justice and mercy at the cross. Grace reigns through righteousness, which is revealed by the gospel of grace. You're in a world in which matters of honor and shame, you've got to understand the honor and shame culture of the New Testament and the Jewish world. They were extremely important. And Paul had to reject the shame heaped upon him by those who despised the gospel as he himself was strengthened by the Spirit and the Scriptures. You know, the ancient pagans mocked Christianity, not only because the idea of substitutionary atonement seemed ridiculous in itself, but also because their mythical gods were were apathetic. They were detached and remote, totally indifferent to the welfare of man. Matter of fact, their gods wanted to stick it to them when they got out of place. The idea of a caring, redeeming, self-sacrificing God was beyond their comprehension. While excavating ancient ruins in Rome, archaeologists discovered a derisive painting depicting a slave bowing down before a cross with a jackass hanging on it. The caption reads, Alexamenos worships his God. And some of you can think of family or friends that think that your religion is your crutch because you're too weak-minded, and so you need a Jesus in your life. You need a Savior. In the late second century, this attitude still existed. A man named Celsus wrote a letter bitterly attacking Christianity. Quote, let no cultured person draw near, none wise, none sensible, he said, for all that kind of thing we count evil. But if any man is ignorant... If any is wanting in sense and culture, if any is a fool, let him come boldly to Christianity. Of Christians, he further wrote, we see them in their own houses, wool dressers, cobblers, and fullers, the most uneducated and vulgar persons. He actually compared Christians to a swarm of bats to ants crawling out of their nests, to frogs holding a symposium around a swamp, and to worms cowering in the muck. Well, thank you, sirs, for your accurate theology, because in our hymns we do sing that Jesus died for such a worm as I. We don't have inflated views of ourselves. We are the off-scouring of society. So Paul says it negatively in our text, I am not ashamed. His boldness here points to his willingness to confess the gospel in public despite the response of opponents, whoever they are, and in whatever means. They're not empty words in his case because he's already endured a lot of suffering. Now, keep your finger here. Run over to 2 Corinthians 11. It delineates a few of those. And, and see if you can find any of these on your list of what you've suffered for the gospel. 2 Corinthians 11. You know, if Paul had just shut up and stayed home, life physically would have been a lot easier for him. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. He's saying, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so in far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number. He can't even remember how many times he's been beaten. It's been so many times. Often in danger of death. Verse 24, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Why 39? Because they couldn't do 40. They would if they could. 2 Corinthians 11, 25, he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. You say, okay, I've had a few of those sleepless nights. Well, was it sleepless because of the gospel? For those you'd witnessed to and would not bow to Christ? 
We really haven't suffered for the good news, so we should not be ashamed of it. Recently, I saw a gospel friend who had posted on social media. He had, he had two bloody elbows because in open air evangelism, many times you don't get physical. I remember nearly 30 years ago uh, being heckled as I am uh, doing street evangelism. And that's the most I got. So you're going to preach Jesus to us. And I'm thinking to myself, you ought to pay attention instead of heckling me because you're going to remember this. But this uh, brother uh, actually was body checked for street evangelism. And fortunately, the cops saw it and the guy went to jail uh, because the cops are ministers, aren't they? God's the one that set them up. And uh, we haven't resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. It usually doesn't come to blows. And yet we can see videos of friends that are faced with the gospel heckled. Usually it's just that uncomfortable silence or them changing the conversation. In those moments, there can be that sinful fear welling up within us, the, the lying emotions, making a mountain out of a molehill. We set it in a gospel trajectory according to Romans 1.16. This is nothing to be able to preach the good news and to do as Ezekiel says, be watchmen, that we release our hands from their blood because we preach the gospel to them. So having objectively denied shame, he's, Paul says, I'm not ashamed, his reason and statement of reality is now given a reason why he's not ashamed. Paul, why aren't you ashamed of the gospel? Because it's the power of God for salvation. Hello? Get with the program, Paul says. This is God's power on demonstration. This message of Christ's perfect life lived, His vicariously atoning death for sinners as their substitute, a sacrifice to God, His triumphal resurrection, it results in salvation. It's the best news ever. And it's not like the kind of conversations we have about the sports team, which as soon as we have that, it has an altered eternity. Honey, why don't you take him out? Thank you. Um, I know it gives me an opportunity to preach a little louder, which I don't mind. <laughs> Paul says this message is the dunamis, the power of God, might, strength, a capability and a this ability signifies the effective and transforming power that accompanies every faithful preaching of the gospel in the church house and outside that church house. The power of God resides in that message. You take the message of the cross, the highways and hedges compelling people to come in. You know, in chapter 3, Paul's going to showcase our power, man's power. And it's not a very good power. He says, all of us have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So left to ourselves, we are not powerful. We're a cesspool of sinfulness. But in the same chapter, Romans 1, he's going to tell us in a few more verses down verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what's been made so that they are without excuse. God's eternal power and divine nature was set on display in the creation account and has remained constantly narrating his glory according to Psalm 19 to this very day. You go out to preach the gospel to somebody and they may say there's no God the psalmist says the fool says that he's lying against what he knows to be the truth in other words he knows there's a God he just doesn't want to talk about him so in our evangelism we're introducing them to the creator God they already know exists and he is also redeemer for those who repent and believe <laughs> what a witness it's not up to our power, but His power, and we just tie into that creation account, the creation that they, they know that there's a previous force, 
This leaves man without excuse, this silent witness. It's, it's wordless communication, as we said in Psalm 19 not so many weeks ago. What it does is it compounds our verbal witness. When we give them the message concerning Christ, you know, through creation, they know there's a God, but they can't get saved through creation. And you preach the gospel, the message of Christ, they work together. Well, the church is not born in Acts chapter 1. The Jesus is going up to heaven. His ascension is in Acts 1. He, right before he goes to sit down at the right hand of his Father, he tells his disciples, remain here until you've got the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power after the Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where the church started in Acts chapter 2. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. Just keep on going about it. Locally, globally. In the Old Testament, we are taught that, the, that spirit indwelling would be part of the new covenant. Acts records that transition from the old covenant to the new. Spirit indwelling is not commanded as charismatic theology teaches, but is instantaneous upon your conversion, you're indwelt by the Spirit of God. We go out in His power, not ours. Re recall the contempt entertained for the gospel by the quote-unquote wise of the world. Rome is the seat of the world empire, the epitome of worldly power, and yet, it's unattractive to man. We know it's unattractive, intimidating, and repulsive to the natural, unsaved person, to the ungodly spiritual system that now dominates the world. The gospel we take out exposes man's sin, his wickedness, depravity, and lostness, and it declares pride to be despicable and works righteousness to be worthless in God's sight. To the sinful heart of unbelievers, the gospel doesn't appear to be the good news, but bad news. And when they first hear it, they often react with disdain against the one presenting it or throw out arguments and theories against it. For that reason, fear of man and of not being able to handle their arguments is doubtlessly the single greatest snare in our witnessing. Well, what if they pose this problem or this question? Just go out and preach the gospel. Again, referring to Dr. Barnhouse, he, he gives this great illustration. He said, I've been told that if you trace on the floor a white chalk circle and put a goose inside it, no inducement of the world can prevail upon the goose to cross the appalling line. He'll starve inside the circle, starve to death within sight of food, but he will not move. There are men and women who are goose-like. Again, this is Barnhouse, not your pastor, so don't get mad at me yet. Save it for later. He says, the chalk marks of fear of custom and convention have been traced for them in circles of flame. They sit with a group of people and someone says, for example, well, after all, all religions are good. So they're afraid to speak out and say that this is not true and that we must obey the divine revelation that has been given to us through the Holy Spirit concerning Jesus Christ. Or they are present someday when somebody says, well, we're all worshiping the same God. And the Christian keeps still and does not cry out that God has revealed to us that there are many lords, many little g-gods, and that Satan often wears a mask called God and that many people worship Satan under the name of God. So, dear friends, if you are goose-like today, step outside the circle, our comfort zones that we've gotten so used to. Your Jeffrey Wilson wrote, the unpopularity of a Crucified Christ has prompted many to present a message which is more palatable to the unbeliever, but the removal of the offense of the cross always renders the message ineffective. An inoffensive gospel is also an inoperative gospel, thus Christianity is wounded most in the house 
of its friends. That great Reformed theologian John Murray said the emotion of shame with reference to the gospel when confronted with the pretensions of human wisdom and power betrays unbelief in the truth of the gospel and the absence of shame is the proof of faith. So Paul is getting ready finally to get to Rome. And he's going to come to Rome the same way he's gone anywhere. For instance, 1 Corinthians 1. He's going to come to Rome the same way he went to Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. He says, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And the whole succeeding context clarifies that the power of the gospel lies in its effective work in calling believers to salvation. For instance, verse 19. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I'll set aside. So when Paul is talking to the saints at Corinth, he's relying not on those lying emotions inside that are screaming, fear, be ashamed, tuck your tail between your legs. It is written, go to the Word. We don't feel it, we don't experience it, but this is what God said. I'll destroy it, all the wisdom of the wise. So where is the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. What are the unbelievers saying? Hogwash. It's all a bunch of fables. Verse 24, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God, as if there were such a thing, he's speaking over the top here. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world, the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. You know, as we feel our weakness, like who are we? to be the flaming evangelist by which God saves sinners. Our boasting is in Him and His powerful message and His powerful conviction. The rejecters regard it as foolishness, but Paul insists it's the power of God. By this time in his ministry career, he had witnessed repeatedly the power of God released through the preaching of the gospel that brings salvation. He had seen people turn from idols to serve the living and true God. Why is that? Because God saves through the message of the gospel. The message is God's word. The word of God is living and powerful. Hebrews 4.12 tells us it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So put away that blunt instrument, dear friend, and get out the word of God. Preach the gospel. Think about that. We speak of God being omnipotent, limitless power to God. And the gospel is the omnipotence of God operative in our day unto salvation. Preaching of the word doesn't just make salvation possible, but also effects salvation to the few who are called. The inseparable connection between the power of God and election is revealed elsewhere as well. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians 1. Oop, went too far. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 4 and 5. Paul said, We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. 
Verse 9, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Over in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. How did God do that? Through the preaching of the gospel. You got man's obedient preaching and God's powerful working together. We don't have to wonder and speculate and question if people are among the elect as we preach the gospel to all, to whosoever will. Their election was made manifest. When they received those words from the apostle, they received it not as the word of men, but as the very word of God, which worked this change in their lives. This is how Paul came to Corinth. This is how he came to Thessalonica. And he would come in similar manner to Rome. Back several months ago, we were looking at the former sinners turned saints in 1 Corinthians 6. This is one of the clearest descriptions he gives on the Corinthians' moral transformation. He said in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now let's stop for a moment. That's a big laundry list of sin. That's a sampling of many other sins. That's the first Baptist church at Corinth because... Can't read verses 9 and 10 about the bad news without seeing the good news when he says, such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. This used to characterize, these sins used to characterize your life. You've been set free. You've been changed. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Deliverance. This term is used in Hebrews 11.7 of physical deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, Egyptian bondage. Salvation, deliverance. You know, as we get into Exodus this Wednesday night, we see the seed of redemption and deliverance that will come to full blossom in the life and death of Christ as we continue to faithfully proclaim it. In Paul's usage of this term, it's spiritual deliverance, spiritual salvation. Terms of saving and salvation usually have a future sense denoting deliverance from the eschatological judgment and wrath of God. When somebody confesses Christ as Savior and Lord, their eternity has been altered. They have been delivered from the wrath to come. God is going to rain down judgment in the great tribulation, which will just be a sampling of all of eternity in hell. You know, as we launch out in faith, driven solely by revelation, there is God's promise of salvation. We obediently sow the seed and God sends others to water while He Himself harvests and saves since salvation is of the Lord. I think we all need to hear today that not only is Paul not ashamed of the gospel, we ought not to be as well because it is the power of God unto salvation. That's his personal reason. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Neither should you be. You know, the doctor, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a physician before God called him into gospel ministry to become one of the great faithful expositors that we look back upon. And in his old career as a doctor, he used to write prescriptions, and so you know what kind of illustration he gives us. He says, shall we venture on an illustration? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's been shown that in the original, in Greek, the word which is translated here as power was used in many different ways in the Greek that was commonly spoken at the time. 
Sometimes it means that we speak of today as dynamic. Yes, but sometimes it was also used for our word prescription. So that our verse could read, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the prescription of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That's the gospel. How do you work it out? Well, I work it out like this. You go to your doctor when you're ill, and when he's diagnosed your trouble, he sits down, writes out a prescription, and he gives it to you. Now, obviously, the mere fact that you are holding the prescription in your hand will not cure you. You know, as we're getting ready to go to Uganda, we were given scripts for anti-malaria medication. And so I had to take those prescriptions so that God forbid if we bring back any amoebas in our stomachs and because we haven't taken the prescription. He says, you say, there's not power in that piece of paper. Well, in one sense, you're right. But I'm equally entitled to say that there is great power in that prescription. In other words, the man has put on paper all this tremendous possibility, this power that can become yours through the various drugs that he's written down. In a sense, of course, there's nothing in the prescription, and yet you see there is. The prescription comes into it, but you duly take your prescription to the chemist and it's dispensed, and then you take your medicine and the powers manifest. Seems to me that the relationship between the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the application of that work by the Holy Spirit, and the gospel itself, the word preached, is something like that. In this connection, the gospel, the word, is the prescription. So the apostle says, I'm not ashamed of this prescription. I am carrying it in my pocket. I know what it can do. Now I like to think that Think that up with what we were considering in verse 14. Paul says, I'm a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. It's as though Paul were saying, I can't help but preaching. I'm a debtor. I feel as a a man feels who has once upon a time suffered from some terrible disease, some affliction. Let us say it was a disease of the joints, for instance. I was having terrible pains in my joints, he says, and I found walking very difficult. I could scarcely move. Of course, I went to my doctor. He did his best, but healing did not come to me. I tried others, consultants. They did their best. No good. Oh, I heard of many sorts of people, and I went to them all. I crossed the ocean. I heard of people in different countries. They all did their best, but I was no better. Last, I met with another physician, and somehow or other, I felt at once that he was different. He seemed to understand me. He seemed to know all about my trouble, and he said, yes, I know exactly what your trouble is, and I can put you right. And he sat down at his desk, and he wrote out his prescription and said, let me give you this. Get it made up by the chemist. Take it, and you'll soon be well. I did so and began to feel my pain going. My joints became more supple, and shortly I became perfectly well. I can now move as I please. I have almost forgotten that I was ever ill and a semi-invalid. This is now my experience. I walk up and down the streets of life, and suddenly one afternoon I see a man coming up on the other side of the street. I don't know the man, but I do know his complaint. He's gotten my old trouble I can tell it by the way he's walking and by the way he's holding himself. He's now as I once was. It's obvious, is it not, that he does not know about this prescription that I now possess. I have it in my pocket. That which I can put that man right. So what should I do? Well, there's no need to argue about it. I'm a debtor to that man. I must tell him what I know. I must cross the road, accost him, and say, excuse me, sir. You don't know me, and I don't know you, but I do know what is the matter with you. Tell me, have you ever heard of this? And I give him a copy of the prescription. You know, says Paul, if I allowed that man to go on suffering like that, when I know of a certain cure, I should be a cad, a scoundrel, in other words. I've gotten the prescription with the potency, the power, the very thing he needs. I must tell him I'm a debtor. There's a sense of constraint within I must. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I'm driven by the very knowledge that I have. 
Now, that's to be true of every believer. We know this gospel of ours is the power in that sense, and we tell others of it. We preach it to them. We tell them about it. We assure them that it's potent, that it will yield the results. It seems to me, therefore, that the relationship between these things, the work of Christ, the application of the Spirit, the gospel, the Word, something like that. Each of them referred to as the power, and each of them is the power, and they work together in that way to the production of, of this certain, assured, unshakable, and unsalable salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is Paul's personal reason of why he is not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. We'll pick up there next week. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news of the gospel that in your kind grace, you allowed to be preached to us, some of us, many times before we finally activated that gospel call in our lives through repentant faith. God, in saving us, you've sent us to see others saved. Help us to be faithful and unashamed of the gospel. We beg you, O oh God, to revive our hearts. Forgive us for any apathy. Forgive us for any mediocrity, help us to step outside our comfort zones and to preach the gospel, knowing that even though many neglect it, many reject it, you will call sinners to faith through our obedient service. Thank you for Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.